Hey, this is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and thanks for tuning in to another of our virtual events. And we're delighted to have two of our favorite authors here with us today. Paul, I'm, I'm going to blow the last name because we were just talking about <laughs> Duaron, <laughs> aka Hercule Duaron. Uh, <laughs> his brand new book, uh, Hatchet Island. And as always, Paul was kind enough to sign a batch of books for us. Got some right there. Uh, and I'll put a, a link to this in the comments field should you like to purchase one. And also joining us today is our good friend, Sarah Stewart Taylor, who has a brand new book out called The Drowning Sea. And she also has signed a bunch of books for us. So uh, there we go. Very stylized signature there. Um, <laughs> I'll put a, yeah, <laughs> looks great. Um, I'll put a link to that as well in the comments field. We don't have too many signed copies of either of these books left. So um, also, if you have questions for Paul or Sarah, go ahead and put those in as they occur to you, and uh, I'll be happy to ask them. Uh, Barbara usually brings me back on screen towards the end of the hour. So Barbara, over to you. Thanks very much, Patrick. I'm so pleased to see both of you. This is yet a new pairing. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I'm going to say it wrong too. Waro, <laughs> which is like Waro because the OI in French is pronounced wa. Uh, so I'm going to call him Hercule from now on. Since <laughs> yeah, I'll take it. I'll in take any it. case, um, it's always a joy to see him and, um, and Sarah as well. So I've developed some commonalities that I wanted them to talk about. But let's start with the covers because if you look very carefully, they're the same palette. I mean, it really is this sort of lovely greens and uh, blues and sort of seascapes and it's wonderful. And then Cirrus, they very thoughtfully made it kind of blurry, which I think is intended to sort of convey the idea of being underwater or drowning. Sarah, did anybody tell you why it's so blurry? But, you know, it's interesting that um, the type on all three of the Maggie Darcy books has that sort of blown out look to it. And um, I, I like it. I think it's, I think it's really, I don't know, it's, it, there's something unsettling about it, which is what I think is meant to come across, you know, that it's sort of this traditional landscape and yet there's something very unsettling and disturbing about the, about the type. Um, it is, I agree. And it's got a lovely representation. <clears throat> Excuse me, you may barely be able to see it up there, but notice the house on the cliff, which will be important as we talk about it. Uh, Paul has written a pelagic mystery. I love it. I've never been able to say that before. <laughs> so you will notice, you will notice the birds. And there's a very nice little anecdote in the back of the bio on this, which I will let Hercule here tell you about, about why he got interested in birding. <laughs> okay, right now? <laughs> sure, why not? Oh, wow. All right. Um, many years ago, I met a young woman who I was very attracted to. And uh, she said, if you want to date me, you need to take up birding because <laughs> I am a fanatical birder and um, that's what we're gonna be doing. And I really wanted to be with her. And so I, I tagged along and 20 something years <laughs> later, <laughs> <laughs> We're married, and I'm and I'm not a bad birder. <laughs> what, do you have a life list? Do you have, do a, have life a life list? You do. I do. Yeah, I, I I couldn't tell you how many birds I have on it. Although she knows, I'm sure. Um, um but uh, I I I do. I, you know, it's I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't have kept at it for so long if I didn't enjoy it. Birds are amazing creatures, and it's it's. Uh, it's been fun actually to watch people in the pandemic discover birding. You know, it's really boomed. So there's one thing. <laughs> when they didn't go back to reading, right? No, that's wonderful. So in order to really enjoy birds, Paul has created a um, an island, a windswept Erie Island off the coast of Maine, which he calls Hatchet Island. But is it based in part on Hurricane Island? Well, there's several islands actually in the book in the book and they're all fictional. Um, so Hatchet is based on Hurricane Island, which was a granite quarry. Um, it, uh, it figures a little bit late in the second half of the book. The, the Seabird Island is actually called Baker Island. There are several Baker Islands in Maine. This one does not exist. And it probably is closest to Eastern Egg Rock, which is where puffins, North Atlantic puffins were 
uh, Atlantic puffins were reintroduced to the United States by Dr. Stephen Kress, uh, who was a, uh, an acclaimed ornithologist. And um, I had the privilege of, of being guided on the island at one stage. This was before I ever got interested in writing this particular book, but got to be in the, the, the blinds and, you know, watching puffins at my feet. And it's just, it really is an amazing experience to be surrounded by birds that way. It really is. I'm addicted to puffins. I spent a lot of time cruising up in the Arctic and so forth and puffins. Oh, yeah. I almost lost my younger daughter who in Iceland decided that she would go over a cliff in order to photograph the puffins. She would <laughs> work for a photograph. But I was trying to figure out how I was ever going to explain to her husband and her father that I lost her in the, in the Atlantic mm -hmm. while she was photographing puffins. But anyway, and, there uh, we are. Well, so puffins there... Sorry? I'm just, I want I'm making a segue here. There are puffins, um, of course, in Ireland, the west coast of Ireland. Right. And my uh, sort of the, the chief ornithologist in the book studied in the Skellux. Oh, which, wow. Yeah. Which Sarah can explain what those are. <laughs> yeah. So they are a, 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 a beautiful, beautiful um, group of islands off the west coast of Ireland. And one of them, Skellig Michael, has become quite famous because, of course, it's where they shot um, all of the uh, Luke Skywalker uh, in retirement scenes in, in the newer Star Wars movies. And um, it was actually when I was researching The Drowning Sea, I was in a part of Ireland where they'd shot some other scenes in the movie, um, Browhead in uh, West Cork. And it... Um, it was, you know, you, you could sort of see how uh, all of the, the Star Wars related tourism had, um, had, you know, I think was both welcomed and there was a slight annoyance about um, <laughs> all of the people looking for Luke Skywalker on the west coast of Ireland. And if you go to the north coast where they shot Game of Thrones, there are actually, you know, whole tourist things that leave from Belfast and drive up to uh, past the Giants Causeway and the whole bit. Actually, Western Island, where I've also spent a lot of time, has a beautiful thing called the Wild Atlantic Way. Um, oh, I, but I don't know if it way. comes down as far as Cork. I think it's more around Galway. Yeah, well, it's it's sort of all along that Atlantic coast. So um, yeah. there definitely are parts of it in um, on that part, the Sheep's Head Peninsula and the beautiful, beautiful parts of West Cork there. So my, my first commonality that I was going to ask you both to address was why did you decide to set your books this time um, close to the sea? You know, in your case, Paul on Islands, and in Sarah's case, in Candy Cork. So Sarah, what, what drew you there? Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, I, you know, West Cork is a part of Ireland that I've always loved. And I would visited a few times and I think I'd always sort of wanted to spend more time there. And so part of it was just this, you know, a curiosity about it and wanting to do a research trip there. Um, it's also the part of Ireland that my family comes from. And so I knew I, you know, I'd been doing quite a lot of research and I sort of had, had pinpointed the part of West Cork where my great great grandfather was born and lived, and um, so I think it was, you know, I think I want, I sort of wanted an excuse to um, to visit uh, this this that part of Ireland, um, but also it just seemed like a great setting for the story I wanted to tell. Um, in this book, I take my main my uh, detective main character, uh, Maggie Darcy. Uh, to Ireland for uh, what's supposed to be a relaxing summer vacation. She's going to spend the summer in a cottage on this beautiful peninsula with her boyfriend and her daughter and his son. And they're sort of going to try to blend their families and um, see if they can, uh, can make this work. And Maggie's deciding if she's going to move to Ireland and try to work there. And, um, you know, there are a lot of things about West Cork that just sort of fit the story that I wanted to tell. It's a place that's had a lot of, um, you know, sort of high-end development. And I, I wanted a, a luxury uh, hotel and a high-end development to be part of my story. It's a place that um, off the coast of West Cork, there have been some very high profile uh, drug seizures um, on boats. And there was some like, you know, some really, uh, 
kind of interesting um, real life material that, that I use to be inspired. And then just the history in that part of Ireland. Um, there was so much wonderful history uh, that you know, I kind of wanted to tap into. So the landscape, but this coastal landscape was essential to your story. Paul, clearly, if you're writing a pelagic mystery, you, you will do better. I just can't resist that. It's so much fun. <laughs> oh, um, you, right. Use that um, word. It's going to work better um, if you're on the main coast rather than in the interior of Maine. So what inspired you to, um, to write Hatchet Island? Well, I've always, of course, Maine is famously a coastal state and is best known for its coast. And I live on the coast and I've wanted to, to write another book that takes place um, on the water. Essentially, the, the problem has been is that game wardens, main game wardens, have some jurisdiction on some islands, but it's a fairly limited deal. And so I had to come up with the right circumstances to justify Mike Bowditch getting involved in um, homicide um, on an offshore island. And it, it, it took, it began to shape years and years ago. Um, my wife and I went to, uh, to visit a, uh, a seabird island and we were greeted by the interns who were working there. This one was not super far off the coast, but many are, many are, you know, 12, 20 miles off and um, are not visited every day by, um, by supply or anything like that. But we happened to, to, to visit this particular island and we were greeted by the interns all of whom were these um, college women. And there were three of them, I think, or four of them. And we started talking to them about, about their experience. And it turns out, well, they were visited every day by the local lobstermen. The lobstermen would come by and they would give them ice cream and of course lobsters. And they said, they're, they're so nice, these guys. And of course, my macabre imagination is imagining. <laughs> it's like these women are so exposed at, out here alone, and, uh, and and it sort of planted the seed for a seabird island being the site of uh, of, um, of a crime novel someday, and a bunch of things came together. The, the biggest one is that actually some of these islands are managed by the same agency in Maine that, um, that the Maine Warden Service is part of. And once I, I realized that, I'm like, well, he has every reason in the world to be involved in this particular crime. So, Well, you wrote an earlier book in which Deer Island figured, but then that one wasn't about birds. That was about deer and the horrible plague of ticks, which I thought you despised rather graphically in that particular <laughs> novel. Um, and so, you know, you do touch on the idea of both of, or not touch on, but part of your books is there has to be some, some economic reason for people to be there. I mean, they can't just live there for nothing. So Maggie, you've already mentioned that you're looking at high-end hotel development. I mean, Western Ireland has, is a natural place for tourism. But Paul, what is it that you, um, uh, introduce as, as um, a, the big income thing for for the for part of the people in the story, the bad guys essentially. Well, the, you know, it's a, the, the sort of the drama that's going on off the coast of Maine right now is climate change, and uh, it's already happened in in southern New England that the lobster catch has plummeted. Yeah. Uh, lobsters are sort of moving steadily north along the coast and uh, so that's going on and it's testing of course these lobstering communities and individual um, uh, fishermen at the same time we also have things like wind, wind turbine turbines that are being uh, proposed for various places one is actually off one of the the, the big islands the most important islands on the eastern coast that's part of the Atlantic Flyway uh, that's being proposed and it's in the works. Um, and in addition, there's uh, a lot of controversy around um, right whales being entangled in fishing gear 
uh, lobstering gear, the lines that are, are used, um, it's primarily a Canadian uh, problem um, in terms of what they use for their, for their gear. But there was just enough sort of, it, when, when you write a crime novel, it's always, I always find it interesting to, to, to bring some of the societal conflicts into it and uh, as, as the, either the, the background or the motivating incident or whatever it is. And, and there's just, you know, you think to yourself, okay, an island with puffins on it. I mean, what can go wrong out there, right? Well, as it turns out, quite, there's a lot going on around there. And, uh, and, and some people are, are not particularly happy at, at, at this moment. So it, it you know, gave me an opening to, to murder somebody. <laughs> not, not personally. You know, I'm, I'm, on the page. On the page. On the page. You know, so both of you, in your own way, have written an Agatha Christie country house murder, by which I mean that you have created a, a basically closed environment. And in your case, Sarah, you've got an actual, more like Rebecca, you've got, a, you've got a house. You've got one of those wonderful big seaside houses. Um, and, you know, I love mysteries that have that kind of structure because, you know, then you, you get to play around with the only people in the, in the, in the building, you know, to, to quote the TV thing, but which actually is the same thing. If you think about it, the Steve Martin series, which is about to have series, you know, season two it's the same thing you know the big apartment yeah. building in new york is the same idea exactly that the only people in the building can be um responsible so sarah what what you know why the house and and did you just need money to be flowing in here in order to make the plot work <laughs> Well, so um, so the house in the Drowning Sea is actually an abandoned um, Anglo-Irish uh, big house from um, you know from the part of Ireland's history where um, uh, pro you know mostly Protestant uh, landowning ascendancy ruled everybody else, and you know so there are these these houses all over Ireland, and I've always been fascinated by them. Um, I wrote my master's thesis um, when I was in graduate school in Ireland on the Anglo-Irish writer Elizabeth Bowen, mm -hmm. who famously lived in and, and owned her family's um, big house, uh, also in County Cork, uh, Bowen's Court. And so I had, you know, I'd done a lot of reading about the history of these houses, and so many of them were were burned during, um, you know, the early 20th century during the War for Independence, and um, the ones that the ones that weren't burned had had sort of a, you know, in some ways, a, in, in many cases, kind of a sadder uh, fate because uh, the families that owned them, many of them left, many of them didn't have the money to keep them up anymore. And so there are these houses all over Ireland, these huge houses that, um, ha you know, many different things have happened to them. But one of the things that's happened to them is they've been bought and turned into, uh, you know, luxury hotels and resorts and, and all of these things. And so I was, I was really interested in kind of exploring that part of Ireland's history and then looking at um, a place that um, I, I was I was just thinking that another commonality between our books is sort of the push and pull of tourism and the environment and you know people having to make a living in these beautiful natural places and you know just as Paul writes about the lobstermen and the conservationists and you know people with competing interests um, I think that's what fascinated me about the story that I wanted to tell that, you know, there are people on this peninsula are fighting against the development. And then there are others who are saying, no, we, if we're going to stay here, if we're going to live here, we need jobs, we need tax revenue, we need this development. And Maggie uh, is, you know, who's, who's on vacation there is sort of getting to know people on both sides of this conflict and um, the conflict you know, bubbles over during the course of this story when a body is found um, beneath the steep cliffs. Ooh, a body. You know, it's really important to remember that those big houses were economic engines. I mean, you know, they supported all the community around them, the people in the village and all, you know, they, they created, they bought their food, they employed their, you know, as servants, the whole bit. 
it was a mini economic environment. And when they came empty, that all went away. Mm -hmm. And so now, now what you're talking about is an effort to replace, to have the house generating income rather than the family with money living in the house. But to maintain a huge house like that, it took an army. It did. It did. And, you know, one of the things that I, that I write about in The Drowning Sea is that those houses have, you know, have, have dark history uh, sort of w embedded in their stones. Um, I think any, any place where colonialism has, you know, has sort of created the landscape as, as it did in Ireland, you have, you know, you have that, that history that's in, in places, in stones. And can you ever really move past that? Um, that's, you know, I think that's the question I'm really interested in. That's a good point for Ireland. I mean, if you have major houses in England, they weren't colonial, but, you know, they were supported by fortunes, some of which were acquired through unhappy means, you know, some of them go all the way back to days of serfdom and so forth, but you can't have multiple generations of people living in a house without secrets and deaths and probably the occasional murder, and, mm -hmm. you know, the whole bit. So mm -hmm. I love that. So Paul, in, in your book, um, there, is, there, is a, there is sort of a great house and there's a family that is supporting it. So where does their money come from? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, there are several islands in, in this book. Um, the first is the Seabird Island. And um, the second is, is an island that's owned by a, a very wealthy, once famous uh, photographer. I sort of, you sort of think of him as somewhere between Annie Leibovitz and, and Ansel Adams and with a little bit of uh, Andrew Wyeth sort of mm -hmm. thrown in where he was, he, he had like, <clears throat> a, you know, a photo that everybody knew you know it's like and this was inspired in my mind by there's a famous photo I can't, by a photographer's name of course is escaping me of this uh, lighthouse being totally engulfed in this this massive wave you know and you sort of see this picture in random places and waiting rooms and things like this and I sort of envisioned this this guy being the same way um, and he's eccentric and wealthy and his wife has decided that what she wants to do with their island is, is recreate the little village that was out there during the granite quarrying days. And so she has brought people out to, to live there. And, uh, and you know, it's, this is also based on something, something real. I won't get into the details of, but, I, you know, that's, you mentioned, Barbara, the, uh, uh, the Agatha Christie uh, connection, and I, I, I both read and listened to, and then there were none before I started writing this book, uh, just because, yeah, she's, you know, she had staked out that land. I mean, the thing about islands that are so, it's so interesting, I mean, in both in fiction and in reality, uh, is they're little each can be this manifestation of, of a strange personality or a strange self-contained community. Um, it gives you a lot to, to work with because they're isolated and usually people who end up on islands do so for a really good reason yeah. <laughs> and experience and, uh, it, it felt like I could I could I could um, portray a number of different kinds of of uh, of the island cultures that exist off the coast of Maine. Everything from you know the 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 rock where the seabird researchers are studying to this former um, you know ghost town village that this wealthy man wealthy genius has has bought and, and, you know, sort of runs as his own private fiefdom. And uh, I don't know, it was, there was a lot to, I felt like there was a lot, to, um, as always, there's almost too much to work with. And the, the, you know, the issue becomes, how do I, how do I focus? So. Well, certainly if you're going to have people working in remote places um, that, that need serious money, artists um, are, are kind of a natural, you know, because 
or today tech geniuses, either way. But um, <laughs> right. well, that works too. But you know, forever, you know, you can have writers or painters or you know, photographers or something whose income is not, you know, doesn't demand that they be worker bees commuting or anything, but they can live in places like your island. Or mm -hmm. as Maggie, you know, is in in Ireland, um, you could also have the same kind of people you know, living in these big houses and supporting them. Well, it, it's funny because um, where as I was reading Paul's book, I, I another commonality is that um, at the center of, of my mystery is a is the woman who grew up in this now abandoned big house. And her father was a famous Irish painter. And there are, you know, I think there is something about um, about artists and mysteries, you know, and the idea that a visual image um, can, you know, could hold clues or could, could somehow be a part of the solution to the mystery. There's just, I, there's just something about that. Um, you know, so I, there are so many mysteries. I love, uh, Nio Marsh, but, um, the golden age writer. And, you know, I think she used, she used art and artists. So, um, so beautifully in, in her books. Well, she did, but you know, let's face it, follow the money is an absolute mantra in crime fiction. You know, I mean, <laughs> The people who have the most to lose are most often the people who, you know, will do terrible things to protect, yes. you know, to protect what they have. If I mean, you know, if it's a it's a low score if you're a fisherman, you know, and barely <laughs> surviving, then you know, you don't have a lot at stake. But yep. so I, I think that, you know, money and therefore sources of money. Are an important thing. But you know what I really find fascinating in your books and the commonality is both of them, and Paul's has developed over a longer period of time because this is your third book and this is Paul's, which one number is this now? 13. 13, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. So what you both have are complicated relationships. Your sleuths are, you know, partnered or want to be partnered with people that um, present a lot of challenges and vice versa. So, you know, I, I think that the relationship it really powered the story to a huge extent. And part of, the, part of the suspense for the reader is, you know, will they or won't they make it? Or how are they going to work this out? So, Paul, I, I've, I've, I meant to ask you this before, and maybe I have, but, you know, Stacy, you brought her in and then you split them up. Mm -hmm. Why did you decide to bring her back? Did, did you always intend her to come back or... Did you sort of run out of attractive alternatives? <laughs> <Just> like, <laughs> no, I'm serious, because he had another no, no, girl there for a while question. and I really liked. Um, so uh, why is Stacy back in the picture and are they going to get along any better now? <laughs> well, I, frankly, um, Stacy, yes, it was always Stacy. It was always going to be Stacy. And uh, when I first brought her onto the scene in, in some of the earlier books, um, she was she was meant to be uh, even sort of Mike to the next degree. You know, Mike is impetuous. She's more impetuous. Mike is self-destructive. She's more self-destructive. And I wanted to, I, I, I did that deliberately because I wanted to put Mike in this position of having to be the responsible one in the, in the party. Um, and, and, and it would be challenging to him. The the this problem or, or opportunity I guess that I created for myself was that you know it, it was hard for I think for a lot of readers to warm to Stacy um, and for good reason you know and uh, and I, I realized that I wasn't doing I wasn't doing her justice I, I you know I think Mike sees Mike was seeing her you know through this lens and um, and maybe I was too and it Readers actually influenced the course of this series. I, you know, I, I, I was listening to them about what they liked and they didn't like, and um, and yeah, there's no, you know, the in Mike's love life, there's no, there are no, there are no villains. The, none of the, none of the, the women that he's been involved with are bad uh, people. And um, but ultimately, of course, he he needs to make a choice. And in this in this book, it starts out with uh, with a kayaking trip he's making with Stacy to this seabird island where she had worked um, in college as an intern and that's why they're going out there initially um, because her friend is 
is is managing the place for this seabird genius who's kind of losing it and uh, and wants um, Stacy and Mike to kind of come and check things out because it's things are getting very weird and and sort of spooky and people are harassing them and um, and uh, so it gave me a chance also just to yeah to sort of put them together as a as a as partners too to sort of show what Stacy is good at which um which i had not done so much in the past either so you know it's um uh it was it was really an interesting it, uh challenge for me to to sort of bring her back and in a way that you know kept her consistent with her the character i had established previously but also showed that she had grown while away from from mike i mean that was the big piece of it was that they were both growing through other relationships so Anyway, well, I, yeah. you did that very dramatically. I still remember the boa constrictor down there in the Everglades, <laughs> or the python rather. I assume you saw the the two hundred pound python that um, has just been brought to everybody's attention. But Stacy dispatched one. I thought rather handily <laughs> when you brought her back. It was really, I was worried the snake would win. <laughs> we would lose Stacy. So Sarah, you know, Connor is actually, it's not about their personalities, it's about their locations. So you, you've, you've had to work out a dynamic where you've got a person in the United States and a person in Ireland. And yeah. are, they, are they having met in your first book in yep. this series? Um, how are you going to work out a, a decent relationship given the fact that their professions pretty much tie them to the place that they are when they yeah. meet? Well, Maggie is is moving to Ireland, so um, the, you know this the the drowning sea is sort of their um, uh, you know their their tryout, I guess you would say. Um, but it's not too much of a spoiler to say that she you know she she really has made the decision to leave Long Island and to um, and to move to Ireland. But the big question is, how, will she be able to do her job? in Ireland. And right. so in this book, she kind of finds out a little bit about what kind of training she'd have to do. And, and she's deciding whether or not she wants to do that. Um, you know, it's, as I discovered doing my research, you can't just, an American homicide detective can't just show up in Ireland and say, okay, I'm here. I'm ready to <laughs> give me a job. Um, so she, you know, she needs to do some, some fairly substantial um, Garda training, uh, just the way that new recruits do. And she needs to learn Irish criminal law and all of those things. And so the book is sort of about, and that will take her away from Connor for a little while to do that training. And so, you know, can the relationship take that? Can she move her daughter to a new place and then be away a lot? And, you know, the, all of these questions kind of come up. Um, but there, you know, it was, it's funny. I did a, uh, I did a talk with Archer Mayer on Saturday and we, we were talking about character relationships. And of course, Joe, you know, Joe Gunther's many relationships over the years. And, uh, and we were saying that, you know, when you, when you think about the kind of relationship or partnership you'd like for your yourself or for your child, you know, you want stability and you want a healthy functional relationship. But when you're picking relationships for your for your series character in, in crime fiction, that doesn't all that doesn't always work so well. You want, you know, you want tension and you want obstacles and you want things not to be quite so easy. Um, and so I think I think, you know, I, I'm sure Paul uh, has had these thoughts too. You know, how do you keep things interesting? Even even when you you know the the love interest is a good person and is a you know, it, it, it is a, it is a love match, but how do you keep things interesting? So that's, you know, I think that's, that's what I'm really thinking about right now. Joe Gunther, all, the medical examiner was always the right woman for him. After <laughs> yeah. he broke up with the rape novel. Um, now, I mean, I have followed Archer during his entire career and we're actually going to talk about his new book on September 29th. He's yes. one of my completely favorite series writers he's great i love those books so much and he's just he's such a a wonderful person too we, I, really I always is. have so much fun he's such a character i own all of his books which is exactly. like a shelf and a half in my library yeah, I was gonna say but it's in any case the the but the question i mean part of the question is all right connor has a job that 
he loves and he needs to be in Ireland. She has the job as a policewoman. She used to be in Long Island. Obviously, your interest here is Ireland, but you know, in the real world, one of them was going to have to give up, you know, and, and move. So, you know, did you 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 wrote the two books to really kind of close out Maggie's life in Long Island so she could move to Ireland is the way I read it, particularly the second book. Yeah, definitely. I, you know, she, I started writing the second book in Ireland and then I sort of had this realization that, you know, she is a, she's a homicide detective. She wouldn't just quit her job. Something would have to happen for her to give up her career and her life on Long Island. And so the second book, A Distant Grave is kind of about that thing. Um, and I, you know, I won't give too, I, I don't want to give too much away to readers, but something happens in that book that makes that, uh, you know, I think a, a, a believable choice for her to make. Yeah, no, I agree with you. But, it, you know, I, I thought that that was, that's the major source of tension. The other, of course, is you've given them children and, you know, any new blended family children can introduce all kinds of um, stress, which you haven't done to Mike and Stacy so, so far, Paul, at least oh, I don't it, think there are any actual kids involved. Well. The, the wolf is the is the child. Right. Well, that's <laughs> true. Shadow. Um, yeah. And Stacy really bonds with Shadow in this book, which I thought was great. I love the wolf. I was worried for a while. There was one book when I thought he was a spoiler, too bad, that I thought he was going to die. And I was really upset by that. I thought you're going to dust him out of this series, oh. but he's so great. Oh, no. No, when, when, when mystery writers get together, we all tell each other, don't kill the dog. Oh, oh yeah. Book. That's right. Cats are, cats are expendable, but not dogs. Not dogs. So, you know, of course, the other commonality is that somebody has to die and there has to be reasons behind it and, you know, follow the money and all the other good stuff. So those are my questions. So what would you like to ask each other? Um, Paul, what would you like to ask Sarah? I would, um, Sarah, I can't imagine writing a, a a series set in a country in which I did not live. Mm -hmm. And I, it's so intimidating to me. The thought of it is so intimidating to me. Now, I, I, you know, I know you, you have been lived there and, you know, you go back for research and, and that sort of thing, but um, how do you, do, does, it, does it give you, like, does you wake up in the, in the night, you know, worried that, that you're going to be, uh, alienating all these Irish readers or Irish American readers who are going to be shaking their head at, you know, your depiction of, of, of the setting. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think I, I didn't write this series for a long time because I was so worried about getting it wrong. You know, I think I, I think because I had lived there and, and studied there and, ha you know, had these sort of ongoing connections, it was like, I knew enough to know how much I didn't know. Uh, and for, for a long time, that was very, um, I think it was very intimidating to me. And it was, it, it's funny, it was actually an Irish friend who I was in Dublin and I was talking to an Irish friend and I said, you know, I've got this idea for a series set in Ireland, but I just feel, I feel like I don't have, I don't have the right to write it. I, I, I shouldn't write it. And she was so funny. She just, she looked at me and she just said, she said, you, you, this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. And she started listing Irish writers who had written series set in America. <laughs> and she said, you know, if so-and-so can do it, if so-and-so, you know, she just went through and- In Maine in particular, if you think about Charlie Parker right, I mean, John, John, right, John Connolly. Connolly yeah. like nobody, nobody better, right? Yeah, and right. Um, so it was, and it was this incredibly freeing thing, for, you know, for her, for, you know, she grew up in Ireland and she loves Irish crime fiction. And she, and she just, she said, you know, you've got, you've got to do your research and we'll help you and, but you should do it, you know? And so I think that, um, I think that kind of freed me, but it, it is, you know, and I do, I, I'm sure I get things wrong and um, I know things I've gotten wrong. And I, 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 you know, I always just really try to come at it from Maggie's point of view, which is that of an American who's, who's, you know, who loves Ireland, who has connections there and who's always learning about it. And that's, that's me, you know, um, I, I, I lived there for years and went to graduate school there, but I, I was always an, an outsider because you are. Um, and so I think bringing that perspective kind of helps, helps to, I don't know, keep me humble probably and to, and to 
make, you know, I do my research because I don't want to get things wrong. Um, but your so point is good that because you're doing the whole thing through a lens of an American in mm -hmm. Ireland, not from an Irish person. And so you can make mistakes or, you know, not whatever because of that. Some, yes, I can, I can make some mistakes. Yeah. Well, not geography and stuff. I mean, the obvious stuff, but cultural stuff, you know, you can, um, you can kind of, you can get away with it because she's an outsider. She can be naive. Exactly. Yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'm going to sort of turn that around on, on you, Paul, and um, you write about a place where, where you live and where you, that you know really, really well um, and where you have lots of connections. Is it ever, do you ever find it hard to write sort of, I mean, you write about all sides of Maine, the, the beauty, the natural beauty, the, you know, the sort of wonderful quality of the people, but you write about a really gritty side of Maine too and, and about the, um, you know, in some cases kind of the worst of human nature how, do you ever do you ever struggle with kind of showing Maine in all of its, you know, from all its angles? Um, no, and and uh, it's it's been funny. I've always been unapologetic about that because I think partly because I worked at a magazine earlier in my career when I first was writing the the, the books that uh, really showcased the the positive. And I, I, I love the magazine. I, um, and I, I, the work I did there, I have, I'm very proud of that. It, you know, I was, as, a, as somebody who grew up here, I just knew all this other stuff that just was never going to make it in, into Down East Magazine. Um, but occasionally, yes, I get letters from, from readers who, or emails from readers who say, uh, geez, you know, I, your experience of Maine is, that, that you're describing in the books is just nothing like what the, the state that I know. You know, my wife and I moved up here from Connecticut two years ago, and we have not <laughs> met anybody who, you know, who, 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 who acts that way. Um, and, uh, and, you know, or, geez, you know, couldn't you be you're 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 going to be scaring off the tourists, you know, with with these depictions of of you know, depraved, uh, homicidal people in the woods. And, and my wife actually came up with this one. She said, you know, if Stephen King didn't do it, I'm not going to be the one. I'll find it. <laughs> He's, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Maine seems to bring out you know some really interesting and unusual writers um like Stephen King <laughs> yeah. as you point out or you know do you remember Jan Willem van de Vettering I mean he, I do, yes. you know he was Dutch and yet wrote books about Maine John Connolly we've already mentioned there's just a um pretty nice woman whose name I can't Sarah Graves who has written yes. books forever set in Demers I think it is um no she she sets it in um in Eastport, which is oh, Eastport. Remote. Yeah, right. I I loved her first series. I I like I really liked it a lot. And you know, but like a, a lot of series, eventually it kind of ran out of gas, and it was time to do something different. So I think you've done really well keeping Mike alive and so interesting for thirteen books. Sarah, you wrote a, an earlier series. Why did you decide to segue over here to this new series, which I really like? What was what was your impetus? Surely it was more than just Ireland. It was, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, honestly, a lot of it was was that I uh, became a parent that in there, and I had I had three babies in five years, and was quite um, was quite sort of occupied with that for a while, and um, and you know, it's funny. I, I I was saying to somebody the other day that at the time it felt like it felt like a real failure that I couldn't keep up the pace of a, of a book a year series, you know, um, as, as a new parent. But as I look back on it, I think, I think that I was also feeling kind of constrained by the amateur sleuth uh, setup, which is what I wrote before. And I think, I think that time when I was, you know, focusing more on, on kids and not writing as much, and I did write a, a series of kids books in there. So I was, I was writing those. Um, I think I was I was storing up a lot of 
inspiration and creativity and a lot of, you know, the, the Maggie series, I, I think a real through line in it is her attempts to be the best parent she can be while also, you know, excelling at her job and that, and that just the pain of that and the tension of that. And, you know, as we all know, it's one of the hardest things. And, you know, I, I don't think I could have written that um, without, you know, without sort of those years of, of thinking heavily about those topics. Um, and then, you know, I, I really miss writing crime fiction and, um, and the, being able to kind of combine my, my love of Ireland and my, I was starting to spend a lot of time in Ireland again. And um, it just, you know, it, it sort of just came together and it was a great, a great way to kind of reintroduce myself, I guess, um, or to, to on-ramp back to crime fiction. That's so interesting. Why crime fiction? Why is that so alluring to both of you? Maybe that should be my last question before Patrick pops back up again. Why, why, why does it grab you so? I, well, I'll, I, I can, I've um, recently talked to somebody about this, and so it's sort of fresh in my mind. I, um, I definitely, most of my books, not all of them, are mysteries in the sense that they come, they're not rural noir, you know, in, in, in a noir book, the world is broken and it, it's the, the protagonist is sort of engaged in this existentialist um, uh, struggle <laughs> against meaninglessness <laughs> uh, to, find, to find some reason to go on and, you know, define justice on their own terms. A mystery, you know, the order is broken at the beginning of the book somehow, and it's by the end, the reader expects some order to be returned. And that has always appealed to me. I don't think that's the way life is, but I think it's, um, uh, it's a compelling um, wish, I guess, for for human existence you know we, we we sort of hope for meaning and 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 look for it and and hope that we can kind of you know that, that there aren't mysteries that are you know remain unsolved uh, at the end um so i i actually really enjoy this and in fact one of the things that for the longest time puzzled me was that amazon was categorizing my books as british mysteries mm -hmm. um, and I'm like, no, I mean, there's no, <laughs> they take place entirely in Maine. There's, there's a main game board as the protagonist. Why are, and I think, but later I began, I think they've redefined it as traditional mysteries. Mm -hmm. And it's like, ah, okay, now I understand why they were, you know, putting me in that, in that category. So I don't know, I don't know what appeals to you about it, Sarah, but that's my answer. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, it's all about ha sort of having the privilege of exploring character under these extreme circumstances, if that makes sense. You know, that I, I think of a criminal investigation as, and the events leading up to a criminal investigation, uh, homicide, unnatural death, you know, it's, it's like it reveals essential character. And to, to be able to kind of look at a cast of characters under that extreme pressure, um, hiding the secrets that they hide and tr you know, trying to do, some of them trying to do the best they can, some of them you know, perhaps uh, responsible for the unnatural death. The, I, I mean, it just comes down to the characters for me. I just love exploring characters in that kind of a setup. And I think it gives it gives you so much room and space to um, to really delve into, you know, human motivation. And um, I just I, I love the extreme nature of a criminal investigation in order to do that. That's a really fascinating answer. I think Paul, at the moment, you know, considering the disorder that the world has fallen into, um, I think the idea of being able to take what is broken and, you know, and restore it in some way is enormously comforting right yeah. now. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how the January 6th committee, which is, you know, basically yeah. a police procedural, um, yeah. you know, going on right in front of us. And, it, you know, it may be defeated by the fact that they will, they will not be able to affect justice, even if they show us why we need it. 
I mean, you know, I think it's an it's a really I wish that I thought I'm too old to live long enough to see what history is going to write about this country since 2016. But I think it'll be fascinating. I have lived long enough to know what we all thought about McCarthy. And here we are again, because, you know, I was born in 1940. So I went through the entire cycle of, of McCarthy and the blacklist by the time I was in college. And I, I think it'll be fascinating to see. You couldn't make up what's actually happened as a novelist. You couldn't. The best the picture. Other, the other thing I will comment on in regard to islands is that it is incredible to me how many books are based are Agatha Christie's, you know, and then there were none, which if you remember had a really pejorative original title, which, yes, I, was, <laughs> which I won't at the which moment. Which happy mentioned. Um, but nonetheless, that it's fascinating to me how many crime writers have come up with islands as settings for the book. And I wonder in part if it's a reaction to the pandemic, you know, or it's, um, I mean, I don't know, but I, it's just, it, it, you know, it's interesting how fiction kind of picks up something out of the zeitgeist and a lot of people explore it and, you know, and then move on to something else. And right now, that kind of isolation, you know, is, is part of what people are exploring, which I think may be a reaction to the pandemic. I don't know. Patrick, come join us and let us know if we have any questions from the audience. There he is. All right. Yes. Um, let's see here. Well, our good friend uh, Paula Mounier is watching. Another oh, French. Oh. Hi, Paula. <laughs> Another miniature author who lives yeah. in the right. Hi, Paul. Yeah. She'll be with us on July, I think it's the 20th for her book. Coming right up. Um, okay, well, let's see. Paul, you've addressed this a little bit, but one of her questions is, uh, so this is number 13 in, in the series. How do you keep it fresh? Mm -hmm. And then she, she says as she writes number five of her series. Mm -hmm. I think it's always by, you know, I. The way that I start every book is I think to myself, okay, where I, I don't come up with a con a high concept, you know. Um, I, I start with where is is Mike Bodich personally and professionally after the last book, and logically where should he be now, and where do I want him to end up at the end of this story, um, in terms of his own you know growth or in some cases a step backwards. And I feel like that that keeps me really honest uh, in my in my stories because I never lose sight of of the fact that at the center of everything is being mediated through this narrator who's having these experiences and, I'm, and is being changed by them. That's the other thing is unlike a lot of mysteries, which I series that I love, um, you know, there are consequences that ripple through from book to book. I mean. It's not like, you know, NCIS where they've killed a bunch of people at the end of one episode and the next episode, everything is copacetic, you know? So it's like, no, that's not the way, that's not the way life is. So it, everything springs forth out of character, obviously yeah. character first. Yeah, let's see. Okay, Paula has a question for you, Sarah. And you've, you've partially answered this, but she says, Sarah, Paul says he was inspired by and, there, and then there were none for this book. Is there a similar inspiration for you and the drowning sea? Mm, that's a good question. Um, you know, I don't know that there was a, I mean, I, to be honest, um, and then there were none was, was probably also sort of tonally, there's something about that book that's um, the, the sort of confusion and the, you know, you feel like the characters are sort of in this fog of, of unknowing and constantly sort of looking over their shoulder. And I, I, I did want to capture a little bit of that. Um, you know, my characters aren't on an island, but they're on this sort of remote peninsula. And there is a sense that it's someone who they know, you know, someone, someone in their, in their circle who may be responsible. And so, um, you know, that was probably a, an influence. Um, Beyond that, I can, you know, I mean, certainly the, the gothic elements in the house, you know, the, the novels like Rebecca and some of the, um, 
you know, some of the, the work I did for my master's degree on Elizabeth Bowen and some other Irish writers was very influential. So it was kind of putting different things together. Um, what was that very famous? Because I remember reading an Elizabeth Bowen book. It's probably her, maybe her best known one. The Last September is the one that, That's it. that people tend yeah. to know, um, which is a, a really interesting and complicated novel. I, I reread it recently, and every time I read it, I find new things that I hadn't noticed. And it's, it's really, it's something. Um, Paula also asks, are you going to move to Ireland too, Sarah? Would you, if you could? <laughs> you know, um, I know I'm not, I'm not going to move to Ireland. I think my, uh, my husband and my kids would, would, um, as much as they like Ireland, they would not, I don't think they would be up for that. No, we're pretty, we're pretty rooted here in Vermont. And, um, I love living in Vermont. I, it's, you know, it's I, Ireland and Vermont are my two favorite places on the planet. Um, I would, I'd love to spend more time there than I, than I, even than I do. Uh, and, you know, maybe that will be a part of my life at some point, you know, spending a couple months a year or something, um, if I could ever pull that off. But um, no, I, you know, I, yeah, I, I, I love living in Vermont. So uh, I think, you know, given a different life, if I, if I had another, another life I could live perhaps, but um, this one is pretty good in Vermont. What, is there a part of Ireland that, um, I know it's a fairly small country, but that you haven't really explored yet that you would like to? Yeah, you know, I, I've, I've been to Northern Ireland um, a couple of times, but I really haven't explored it the way I've, I've explored the Republic. And that's my, I think my next trip, I'm, I want to spend a lot of time in Northern Ireland. Um, and I just, you know, it's just, it's an absolutely beautiful part of, a part of the island. And um, there's, yeah, there's so much there that I, I want to learn more about. So I think it would be the North. Let's see here. Um, Oh yeah, I have to take issue to this uh, cats are expendable comment, Barbara. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I thought I thought of you when I said that. I knew you wouldn't be happy with it. Nonetheless, um, you know, I I think pets in general um, that mystery writers try. I mean, the dog is kind of the focus, but in general, yeah. I think that um, yeah. nobody really wants to kill the pet goat or the pet sheep or the you know or the loving cat or whatever it may right. be. People can be slaughtered, but not pets. I mean, it's kind Absolutely. of Absolutely. Not animals. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. Um, Jerry just asked a question. Paul, you're on book 13. Uh, do you have a chart to keep characters straight as you write about as you write about characters that started in book one and so on? Um, how do you keep everything straight in your head? Not as well as I as I should. Um, years ago, the writer Julia Spencer Fleming, who's a friend of mine asked me over dinner, I was on book four or something, and she said, well, have you started a, a series Bible? And I didn't really even, I didn't know what that was exactly, but she explained to me that it was, you know, a way that as a series grew, you recorded, okay, this character is five foot six and has brown eyes, so that the next time you bring her in, she doesn't have green eyes. And at the time, I just thought this was a ridiculous concept. Um, you know, 13 books later, there have been a, a couple of continuity errors that, you know, pain me. And uh, I've tried to get better at, at that, uh, at keeping everything straight. Because, yeah, it's a lot to, to hold in your head. I, I understand that, that George Martin has a, um, a super fan whom he employs to be his his uh, all-purpose knowledge resource of, of all of the various houses yeah. and, and everything. And I'm like, yeah, that's what I need is I need a super fan. <laughs> like, you get an intern to do. <laughs> doesn't seem to be speeding up his uh, output though, does it? No, no that doesn't, yeah, no. Yeah, no, but then he's busy producing the Dark Winds, you know, which I'm really happy to see that Tony's novels and and Anne's combined um, are getting a new life on the screen. So I have not seen that yet, but I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, it's it's a lot different than the first time around. Um, yeah, oh, well, that's you know, good. That's good. Which I think is great. The only thing I wish they had were captions. It can be difficult to really understand um, some of the dialogue in 
you can watch it on what is it fubu or something and then amc but whatever captions don't appear to be a uh, a feature and i think that's kind of a shame so i i was going to drop in a note because she probably could introduce that yeah oh, oh yeah good good question from robin has just come in she says i love sarah's books the the one thing about sarah's first series that was extremely interesting was uh, Sweeney's occupation in funerary art. Mm. Uh, and that's also, um, Sarah, as you know, just wonderful cemeteries in Ireland. Um, what was the one, um, oh my gosh, is it called Glendalock? You ever been right. There? So yeah, I mean, Gl Glendalock, uh, which is uh, a, an old monastery, the site of an old monastery in the Wicklow Mountains. Um, there are two beautiful lakes and it's just, it's a really peaceful, spot and you know it's one of those places where you, you you stand there and you understand why these these monks decided to settle there and contemplate um their faith and nature right. um so yeah no and there is there is a, a wonderful cemetery with some you know with very ancient stones but then also with some more recent ones that was the, the first time i really explored that cemetery i was it was so interesting to find you know 20th century stones in there too. And um, yeah, it's a wonderful place. But the funerary art was there. Where did that come from? So uh, that case, so the, the origin of that series was um, many years ago, I was uh, at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. And there was an exhibit of uh, funeral uh, jewelry and f gloves that people had worn to funerals and all of these sort of objects associated with the Victorian, you know, rite of mourning. And I stood there in the museum and, you know, I was probably 22 years old. And I thought to myself, hmm, a detective who's an art historian specializing in funerary art, that would be a great series. And uh, it took me a while to actually write it. But um, that's really where it came from. And it was so much fun, you know, living in New England, it was so much fun to write that series and, you know, visit the art, the old cemeteries, the Puritan cemeteries we have here in New England. Oh, yeah. um, it's it interesting how that stuff is fascinating. The Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Fashion Institute did a funerary um, yeah. exhibit as well. And it was really intriguing to, I remember going to it and I was fascinated by it. All the rituals of mourning. Exactly, exactly. And I think, you know, in a lot of ways, I think we, we don't have enough of those rituals today. Um, you know, I mean, I think depend, depending on one's faith, um, you can either have a, a very beautifully laid out set of rituals um, or none at all. And it's hard to process death and loss without some kind of ritual. I agree. I think grief, it requires it. I mean, that's you know, it's helpful to to have a, an estate to settle because it gives you mm -hmm. things to do. We've, I've just done two of them in the last two years and it's a process that does help you, you know, work your way through it for sure. Anything mm -hmm. else, Patrick? Um, just as a very big digression, have you, are you familiar with the Harlem Book of the Dead? Um, not really, not really. I feel like- book, I, a compendium, but, oh, man, and it was about, um, you know, funeral photography in Harlem in the early part of the century, I, th I believe, like up maybe into the 20s and something like that, Harlem Renaissance up to that period. And it's yeah, all photographs, really amazing, fascinating book. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. I, I've, I feel like I've seen references to it, but I've never actually seen it. And, you know, uh, death photography is a fascinating thing that we, you know, the Civil War kind of made it popular. And, um, you know, for many people, the only time they were ever photographed in their lives was after they had died. Yeah, for sure. There's uh, the whole Victorian thing was is fascinating because photography, what was it about 1840, I think, when those first pictures were taken at Lake Hog Abbey. And mm -hmm. um, so it was a big thing. And, you know, the ability to capture wasn't Conan Doyle one of the people that thought that you know you could capture the person's soul in the yes. in the photograph? Yeah, Maybe right. not Matt Doyle, but you know he was really into all of that after his son died. Oh, yeah. he was he spent the again, rest of his yeah. life trying to process that. Hmm? And the spiritualist right. movement is right around that same time too. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, it's a fascinating area. So let's wind up then and ask you what you're working on. I always like to leave people in hope that they're going to get another book. So Paula, is there going to be a 14? Oh, yes, yes, it's well underway. Um, it's uh, it's due in the fall and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm well into it. I'm trying to think about anything that I could give as a as a tidbit, but- uh, Oh, you don't have to. I just like readers to be able to know that there will be another book. There will be, yes. And it is part of the what about you, sir? Uh, yeah, so I, I've just turned in uh, Maggie number four, and um, she's in she's in Dublin this time, and it was it was really fun. I sort of focused on one Dublin neighborhood, and kind of the the you know really kind of the history and the people of this neighborhood, and um, it was it was fun to write. I hope I hope it'll be fun to read too. I'm sure it will be. Well, that's exciting for all you fans to know that you've got treats in store. Exciting for me because I'm a fan of both these books, of both these authors rather, and their series, also these particular books. So let me remind you that we do have autographed copies, both of Paul's book, Hatchet Island, and Sarah's book, The Drowning Sea, although as Patrick pointed out, not a whole lot of them left. So yeah. don't delay. It'll be perfect Fourth of July reading, right? Anyway, guys, it was lovely to see you. Um, I always look forward to the end of June when I get to talk to you. So thank you. We'll do it again. Maybe we can do it before we get to the end of June if we can find something suitable to do. Maybe we should all gang up on Archer. Oh, that would, I, I, yes, I would, I would absolutely be. That would sort of be fun. You know, so see if you're free on September 29th and let me know. It'll be like um, 930 your time because He's all engaged in, you know, he has multiple careers as a um, EMT and a firefighter and, you know, volunteer policeman and all. So he can only do events when he's not actually on duty. Yeah. So that's when he's not on duty. <laughs> it's 930 on the, at night, but it, that'd be fun, you know. Um, Zoom bomb him. Yeah, let me know. That'd be great. Maybe we can work that out. Anyway, good night, everybody. Thank you so much for Thanks. joining us. There is a Thank live event at the Poison Pen at 7 o'clock. Dan Patrick will be running because I'm not able to walk down there at the moment. Yeah. But um, And then we have a live event on Wednesday night with Julie Clark, which will be fun. So it's nice that real live events are actually starting again. So maybe next June, we can get you back to Phoenix. Oh, be fun. Never mind that it will be 110. Oh, I don't care. <laughs> you have excellent air conditioning, as I remember. We do. Right. We have fabulous air conditioning, and we do dinner, so it'll all work out. Anyway, good night, everybody. Thanks right. Thank you, everybody. Barbara. Thank you, Patrick. You bet. Thank Thank you. Pleasure. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them, and your help would be appreciated. Please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.